Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Ashley. We've got a lot going on around Park Valley Church and I would like to highlight a few events coming up. If you're wondering if there's something more in your faith journey, or maybe you want to discover more about what it truly means to know God, we'd love for you to join us for Growth Track. These classes are designed to walk you through what we believe here at Park Valley and help you discover how you can use your gifts to serve others. It's a four-week course that is held every month. Next week is a perfect time to start with our 101 class. It will be offered during the 930 and 1130 services. Hey church, my name is Allison and I work with students here at Park Valley. Parents, next Friday, make sure to bring your middle schooler and all their friends to Rec Night from 7 to 9 at Alvey Elementary. Rec Night is a great opportunity for middle schoolers to play some awesome games, meet new friends, and have a fun Friday night out. And next Friday, we're turning it up a notch and going blacklight. And finally, our job fair is taking place next Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's going to be in the main lobby. Be sure to bring your resume. As always, you can find out more information about anything going on at Park Valley at the info bar in the lobby or on our website. Thank you for being with us today, and we hope you have a great week. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Hey, um, I wanted to share something with you real fast. Um, we have... Uh, definitely we have a few needs here at the church, and one of them is for people who are willing to, you know, step up and really leave a legacy in, in people's lives, especially children's lives. And, you know, I remember back when I was in preschool, um, my parents would take me to Sunday school, and I literally would be screaming because I, you know, when they were leaving me in the room, I remember being up against the door literally as if it was yesterday. And it was preschool, so it was not yesterday. Um, but I'm up against the wall going, ah, you know, freaking out. Uh, and I remember there was this lady by the name of Mrs. Hazelwood. Her name was Donna Hazelwood. And she would always come up and she would just be like, Hi, Barry. <laughs> she just had this, like, I don't know about her, you know? And she had this always look on her face like, I love you. And she was smiling, and she was always so calm, and she was just the greatest Sunday school teacher I ever had in my life. And I had other ones, too, and they were great, too. But she, she just had this way of, of making me feel like I really wanted to be there. And one thing cool about Mrs. Hazelwood is that she taught me John 3.16, the greatest verse, yeah. I mean, this verse is amazing. You see it at golf tournaments, you see it at sporting events all over the place. It's just a, it's a pow, powerful verse, and, and she taught me that verse. And so I'll just never forget the influence that she had on my life, even when, even when I was in preschool. It just made a difference and touched my life. And, you know, I, I don't know how many times I've had ladies that have come up to me, and they have said this, I want you to know this, your grandmother taught me when I was in sixth grade, and she had an impact on my life. And I thought back to my grandmother. My grand, Mrs. Hazelwood's in heaven, right? Um, my grandmother taught hundreds and hundreds of sixth grade girls for over 30 years in her classroom, teaching them how to be moms, teaching them how to be good wives, teaching them how to love Jesus, teaching them how to navigate through those crazy teenage years that everybody goes through, that they were getting ready to enter into. And again, I've just had so many come up to me. And then, you know, I think about my start in the ministry. I started out teaching middle school kids. And Christine and I were a team, and we taught middle school kids. Six, it was seventh and eighth grade kids. And, and you know, everybody knows that's a challenging time of life, middle school. Remember that? Um, so we were able to kind of come alongside those kids and love them and teach them about Jesus. And so they always say, when you announce something, you never say the word need. People run away. I, I don't care. I'm going away from all that and just saying we have a need. Uh, all right. Um, and please know this. On Saturday nights, we offer all of our programs completely, all programs, preschool, um, elementary, all, all ages, all programs, uh, underground, which is our middle school ministry, all of those programs are offered on Saturday night. You know what? I've also had some meetings with some people this week that have said, say something to the church because we're in trouble. 
we need some help. We need some people that are going to come in there and make a, a leave a lasting legacy in these kids' lives. And so what I thought I would do is just ask you to, to think about it and pray about it. Um, we've got a couple tables out in the front. They've got orange coverings on them, and they've got balloons and smiling faces behind them. And let me just say this. Kids' ministry is not like it used to be, okay? We got kids' ministry on steroids here at Park Valley. All right, so just know that. It's a lot of fun. It's an incredible ministry. And, and by the way, if you step into that ministry, everything pretty much is going to be done for you. We set the table. We have a complete staff that works on preparing, you know, all the curriculum and all the lessons and everything like that. And so all you got to do is just be willing. And so here's the deal. If you want to, you can get out of your seat right now and go to the table and you can skip church today. <laughs> you can skip. You don't even need a hall pass. All right. Just get on up, go on out to the table, grab an extra donut, sit out and watch a little TV. I don't care. Uh, but we just want people to get connected. And what I'm saying is this, it, it'll make a huge impact on your life. And it also will touch the lives of a whole lot of kids. And so let me put you on the spot and ask you a question. How many of you would at least be willing to pray about leaving a legacy in a kid's life? Wow. Thank you so much. I think we're going to get this thing covered because uh, in every service, we've had so many people say that they would do that. And so thank you very, very much for that. Uh, you know, I'm convinced that, you know, hands down, the most important relationship that you will ever have in your life is your relationship with God. You know, and so we've been talking about restoring relationships. So I wanted, I wanted to close this series out talking about the most important relationship you'll ever have. And I believe that's true for even people who have convinced themselves that God isn't real and God doesn't exist. And, you know, if somebody came up to me and they said, I don't even believe in God, I would say, okay, it's cool. Let's talk a little bit. Can we just talk? You know, God doesn't approach it that way. For the people that say they don't believe in God, this is what God says. You're a fool. And I know that's in your face and I know that's just whatever, but I'm just the messenger. All right, I'm just giving you the message. That's exactly what he says in Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, verse, verse, verse. He says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, there's a reason for that, okay? A couple reasons, and they kind of make sense, so just listen to this. The first reason is because you wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for God. So it's just a little bit weird for somebody who was made by God to then turn right around and say, God, you don't even exist. I know you made me and gave me all my breath, but you don't, you're not real. That's just kind of foolish. There's another reason it's foolish. It's foolish for somebody to say there is no God because you're completely surrounded by evidence of God on a daily basis. We see the presence of God all the time. I mean, we see it in creation. We see it in the fact that we understand morality and the difference between good and evil. We have proof of God Every single time we feel bad inside because we do something that's bad, you know? You ever wonder who came up with the whole good and bad list? And who came up with that list? I'm going to tell you, God did. Uh, the reason why good and evil exists is because there is a God, and he causes us to actually feel guilt in our, our hearts. We see life change in people's lives, you know, because we pray for them or because they read the word of God. And all of a sudden, they begin to change for the better. Tell me there is no God when you see people's lives change all around you. It's incredible. When you see God answer prayer, tell me that God doesn't exist just because of the fact that we have this capacity to care. You see, the average person is going to ask the question. They're going to say, you know, how can there be a God? You have to say it that way. How can there be a God? Because there's so much pain in the world. People will ask that question, right? Well, here's, here's what I would say. Why would you even care if there wasn't a God? Why would you even ask that question if there wasn't a God? Why would you care that so many people are in pain if there wasn't a God? So even people that ask that question are with an exclamation point proving the fact that God exists. Just the fact that we have knowledge, just the fact that you're here on a ridiculously cold, almost May morning. 
instead of being out doing other things with a coat on in almost May. <laughs> Proves to the, the fact that there's a God. You're here worshiping God. You know, you're here with the knowledge of God. And so, you know, what I'm saying is this. Everybody is craving a relationship with God. And, and here's the thing. Until we meet him, we basically look for meaning and purpose and a whole bunch of other stuff. And life becomes this big process of elimination, which becomes, quite frankly, a string of disappointment after disappointment after disappointment, trying to fill this void in our lives, when all along we've been craving God. All along it's been God. Second book of the Bible, what does he say? Don't worship anything other than me. <laughs> Hello, for, here's the info on this. The info is this. Don't have anything else at the center of your life. And it's not as if we're trying to put all of these terrible, evil things at the center of our life. I've never had anybody come up to me and say, I worship murder. No one says that. That's weird. No one says, my life revolves around murder. I would say, okay, please leave. You know, I don't want to be around you. That would be really, really weird. It's not like people are putting these evil and sinister things at the center of their life. It's not these terrible things at the center. It's just that they put temporary things at the center. And you can't expect something that's temporary to give you the hope and the fulfillment you need like only an eternal God can give you. God is the one that gives you. Look, the house, it's awesome, but it's temporary. The dream job is temporary. The nice car is temporary. All those things are temporary. And at the end of the day, you think, it's just not really kind of put me over the edge. It's not giving me that hope and that fulfillment because it's always, always been God. And we crave a relationship with him. See, here's the deal. God is relational and he made us like himself. So we are relational too. And we crave relationships. Like I've said a thousand times, that's why we write songs like, Ain't No Mountain High Enough. Ain't no valley low enough, ain't no river wide enough to keep me from getting to you. Because I want a relationship with you, right? And for some people, that mountain or that valley or that river, maybe I'm willing to do whatever it takes so that I can be with you. I will compromise my convictions so I can be with you because I'm scared to death of being alone. I will put myself in abusive relationship after abusive relationship because I'm scared to death of being alone and I'll do whatever it takes. If that's the mountain I got to scale, I'll do it so I can have somebody in my life. We're craving relationships because God made us to crave them and we'll do whatever it takes to get them because we're afraid to be alone. Why do you think there's verse after verse in the Bible where God reassures us over and over again, you will not be alone with me. You will never be alone with me. I will never, ever leave you. I will never forsake you, ever. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number five. Joshua chapter one and verse 11 says, don't be afraid. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Genesis chapter 28 and verse 15 says this, behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse number 10. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. You will never be alone. Put me at the center of your life. Worship me more than anything else, and I will never, ever leave you, ever. I just love it, how God is so relational, and he made us like himself. That's why Genesis 1.27 says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. And God's crazy about us. He loves us so much. He cares about everything that you could ever go through in your life and I go through in my life. You know, I wanted to share just a few verses in Exodus with you this morning. Exodus 3, 1 talks about Moses, how he's in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness taking care of Jethro, his father-in-law's sheep. And the Bible says that one day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness, and he came to Sinai, the mountain of God. And, and I think about that, and I think about how long before he had even gone back to Egypt to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, he was already at Mount Sinai. God had already showed him this mountain. This mountain was a special mountain because 
two really, really important things happened with Moses on Mount Sinai. The first thing was he got his, his call. Remember, he saw the bush that was burning and it wasn't consumed and he heard the voice of God and he took off his sandal, sandals because the place that he was standing was holy ground. And God said, you know what, Moses, you're going back to Egypt and you're gonna get my people out of there. And Moses said, I'm actually not gonna do that. And this is really weird, but I'm not doing that. And that's pretty much what he said. Literally, at the very end of his conversation, he said, God just said somebody else. He used excuse after excuse after excuse, but he found his specific calling from God on Mount Sinai. Not only did he get his call, but he also got the law. Because later, when he got the children of Israel out, they went to Mount Sinai. God gave them the Ten Commandments, and God said, this is how I want you to live, and this is the direction I want you to go. And he gave him, a spe- he gave him the law on Mount Sinai. So this was amazing. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to look up the word Sinai, and I think I'm going to be blown away by what it means. I, I, look at, I think about that all the time when I'm studying or getting ready for a message. So I looked up the word Sinai, and here's what it means. Desolate. <laughs> I'm like, desolate? Really? I thought it would be something else. I thought it would be something amazing and that would blow my mind. But the more I got to thinking about it, the more it made sense to me. It just makes sense to me that God shows up in the most powerful ways in the most desolate of places a lot of times in our lives. A lot of times we think we are alone. A lot of times we think there is no hope. A lot of times we think our life has hit a big old dead end. And that's where God shows up. And that's where God maybe gives you a call. Or that's where God literally gives you a specific instruction as to what he wants you to do and where he wants you to go. He shows up in the most powerful ways in the most desolate of places. Why? Because he's relational and he cares about us and he loves us and he wants the best for us. Sometimes we don't see it that way for whatever God is, uh, allows in our life, but but he always shows up in powerful ways. And I love it. When When he received the law and Moses came down with a glow in his face and I thought to myself, and this sounds a little bit corny, but I can have a glow about me even though I'm in a desolate place. Because people can know, you know what, that guy's different. There's something about him. There's something about her. They have a relationship with God, and it shows up in the way they live. So there's this cool little leadership principle that says it's very difficult to lead somebody to a place you haven't been yourself. And so when Moses is in Egypt, and he makes the decision to walk away from everything, and he goes out into the middle of nowhere to Midian, we see that God was literally putting him in a place of preparation so that one day he could put him in the position that he wanted him to be in. And again, sometimes God leads us out into those desolate places just to prepare us. You say, but I don't like this place right now. Well, God may be preparing you where you are now for something he has for you in the future. It may be a position that God has for you. We're all, all of us are that way. Moses was that way. 40 years in the middle of nowhere until a bush gets his own fire. And he's like, okay, now I'm connecting the dots. Now I understand what's happening, you know. And it's the same thing with you in your life and, and, uh, and how, how God prepares us for whatever position that he has for us in the future. But I love Exodus 3, 7 and 8. It says this, the Lord told him this, I've seen the oppression of, of my people in Egypt. Why? Because he's relational. He says, I've heard their cries. You don't have to raise your hand for this, but how many times have you ever just with tears pouring down your face, been on your knees, pouring your heart out to God? Man, I have. He knows every tear. He knows every challenge. He knows everything that we go through. He knows when, when just like it says here, when, when we cry. It says, I've heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering. So I've come down here to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians. I'm going to lead them out of Egypt. I'm going to give them their own fertile, spacious land. And it's going to be a place that flows with milk and honey. That's what he said, you know, and to me, I know that God is relational because he loves me and because he cares about me and because I read in his word that he sees when I'm oppressed and he hears my cries and he's aware of my suffering and he doesn't just say, oh man, too bad for you, Barry. No, he shows up and he does something about it and he delivers me, you know, and, and I just have that kind of faith in him and so um, what, I, what I wanted to do at the end of this series is just to let you know that the greatest relationship that you could ever possibly have is a relationship with God 
And the way you have that relationship is through his son, Jesus Christ. And I don't know of a better way to celebrate it than have a little piece of bread in your hand, a little piece of, little, little cup of grape juice, uh, to be able to be reminded of how much it cost for you to be able to have that relationship. It's very, very, it was very, very, exp- it was a very expensive price that Jesus paid. You know, I think about Romans chapter 3 and verse 22. The Bible says some th- simple things. It says, God makes people right with himself through their faith in Jesus Christ. That's what he does. And, you know, why do we have to be made right? Why do we have to be made righteous? Why do we have to be able to uh, have this happen so that we can have this relationship? Well, because the Bible says we're sinners. And because we're sinners, there's this offense that God, God has been offended because of our sin. You know, we always say this, we say it all the time, we're born sinners, right? The reason I know that is because, you know, all of our kids are... You know, I have four kids, and they're expert sinners. I always say that. My four kids were always expert sinners. And the reason for that is because they were born that way. You were born that way, too. All of us were. That sin causes an offense or a, a division between us and God. Remember, we crave no division. We crave Him. We crave a relationship with Him. And so, you know, it just makes sense that, you know, have you ever been offended by someone? If you're offended by them, do you want to just run up and hug them? If somebody offends you, oh, come here, give, bring it in. No, you're like, get away. I don't want to hang out with you right now. I told you about my neighbor that offended me, and I saw him in, a, in an aisle in the grocery store, and I went to another aisle. Even though I needed that aisle, he was in. I said, I'm not going down that aisle. I'm not doing it. I'm going to another aisle. You know what? Call me whatever. I'm a pastor or whatever. Who cares? I don't want to be around that guy right now is what I was thinking, and that's wrong of me. But I'm just saying that offense creates that separation. And so what do we do? Naturally, if you went to God, you would say this. You would say, hey, God, you know, uh, sorry. Is there a way I can make it up to you? And God could say, yeah, absolutely, you can make it up to me if you die. And then I would say, okay, God, is there another way I can make it up to you? (laughs) How about is there a plan B on that? And Jesus says, well, no, God says, actually, honestly, it's not about what you can do. It's not about what you have the ability to do. It's about what I've already done for you. I sent my son to pay that very price that I myself set, which is death for sin. And you don't have to die. All you have to do is believe in Jesus and receive him as your Lord and Savior. And as a result of it, that offense is washed away. That division is gone. That space is gone. That offense has been paid for and satisfied. And now you can have that relationship that you've always craved. You didn't know it. You thought it was a brand new whatever, but it ended up being a relationship with God. And you can have it through Jesus if you put your faith and trust in him. And so what I wanted to do, and and let me just say one more verse, and I know other verses pop into my brain and whatever, but I think about, how many of you guys know Thomas in the Bible? Anybody know Thomas? What do we call Thomas? We call him Doubting Thomas. I think that is a terrible thing. And I call him that too, you know. He was so much more than just a doubter. Thomas was the guy when Lazarus was dying and Jesus said he was going to go back. Thomas was the guy that said, I know going back to where Lazarus lives is a very dangerous thing because people there want to kill us. But Thomas stood up and said, hey, if we we die, we die. Let's go back with Jesus. He had that kind of courage. History says that Thomas was run through with a spear and killed with a spear because he would not turn his back on Jesus. Hey, we call him Doubting Thomas, but I say this, I wish I had the guts of a Thomas. I wish I had the courage of a Thomas. I wish I had the guts that would say, I will never turn my back on Jesus, ever. So there was this time when Thomas doubted. He did. But even through that doubt, we get something really, really powerful and really, really special. Because when Thomas doubted, he said, unless I put my finger in his hands and my hand in his side, I will not believe. And he made that declaration. And then all of a sudden, there's a room full of apostles and Jesus is standing there and he looks at Thomas and he said, hey, you want to put your finger here? You want to put your hand in my side? Go ahead. And it crushes Thomas. Crushes him. 
This is what he says. Verse number 28. He says, my Lord and my God is literally what he says. That is a wonderful statement because in that one statement, we get so clear the fact that Jesus is God. The fact that Jesus is deity. Yes, he is Lord. He is master. But he is God in the flesh. Because if he wasn't God, he would have looked at Thomas and he would have said, stop talking. Don't you ever call me God again and get up off your knees. Do not worship me. That's what he would have said. But he accepted his worship and he accepted the fact that he called him the God of the universe. Why? Because Jesus was God in the flesh. So we get the deity of Jesus right there in that passage. But we also get something else that's really special. Verse 29, Jesus told him this. He said, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. The word blessed means fortunate, well-off, and happy. He said, for all of those who believe and haven't seen me, they're going to be fortunate, they're going to be well-off, they're going to be happy. You see, every single weekend, I walk, I get up here and I say, hey everybody, I want you to meet Jesus. Jesus, everybody, everybody, Jesus. And you're sitting out there saying, I can't see him. He's invisible. Where's Jesus? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's why we call it faith. Because if you could see it, it wouldn't be faith. It's believing in somebody that you can't see. Isn't it interesting that every single relationship starts with faith? Every relationship. You know how many weddings I've done over 28 years of being a pastor? Tons of them. Lots and lots of weddings. And I see these two young people looking at each other like, I so believe in you. I'm so in love with you. You're like amazing. (laughs) Right? (laughs) We're going to be together like forever. They use the word like a lot for some reason. This is like amazing. But what they're saying is this. I believe in you. I believe that the promises you're making me today are going to last and that we're going to have a relationship that's going to last. What is it? It's a foundation of faith. It's the same thing when it comes to Jesus. I can't see him, but I believe in him. And I trust that the Bible says, just like Jesus said to Thomas, that I'm going to be fortunate and I'm going to be well off And I'm going to be happy for having faith in believing in somebody that I cannot see. That he is real. That he wants a relationship with me. That he will change my life and give me the strength and the power to walk each and every day of my life. I believe it. That's why when somebody comes up to you and says, hey man, quit talking about Jesus all the time. Just look at him and say, well, I just wanted you to be fortunate, well off and happy. Is that too bad or is that wrong? Same thing with your kids, right? That's why Jesus is the center of this ministry. He's the foundation of all that we do here. It's all about Jesus. Because he's the one that saves. And he's the one that gives us this ability to have this relationship. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to do it a little differently today with communion. We're going to ask you to get up out of your seat. Come to these stations. We've got stations at the front, stations at the back, stations at the top. They're all over the place, so hopefully it's no waiting, all right? So what we want you to do is go ahead and get up right now and head to one of these communion stations, grab your bread, grab your grape juice, and hold on to it for just a minute while I talk, and then we'll partake of it all. I don't know why I use the word partake. Um, We'll have it all at the same time together. So get your bread and get your grape juice, and while you're moving around, I'll talk a little bit. So, there are probably some people that say, how is it that, how can I know that Jesus is my friend? How can I know that I have this relationship? And how can the people around me know the same exact thing? How can other people know that I'm a friend of Jesus? Well, there's this verse in John 15, 12 through 17. It says, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I loved you. There's no greater love than to lay one's life down for one's friends. He talks about friends. We have no doubt as to the friendship of Jesus for us. He laid his life down for us. He laid his life down. That's why we're getting this bread and getting this grape juice to remember what he did 
for us. Verse 13, or verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command. Well, what's he commanded? Verse 17. This is my command. Love each other. Love each other as I have loved you. That's, that's what he says. He says, people are going to know that you have a relationship with me because you love them, just like I've loved you. It's a dead giveaway. That's the command that he gives us if we want to be his friends. And so what Jesus does is this. He said, every once in a while, because you're good forgetters, I want you to remember the most important things. I do not want you to forget my sacrifice for you. I do not want you to forget my love for you. Please, whatever you do, do not forget these things. And so every once in a while, I want you to have the Lord's Supper. I want you to have a piece of bread that represents my body, and I want you to have a, some, um, in our sense, grape juice that represents my blood that I shed for you, and I want you to remember it. Now, these are symbols. Trust me, it's just Welch's grape juice. Welch's grape juice is not going to wash away your sins. If it did, you, we wouldn't be able to keep it on the shelves, right? Um, it's a symbol of his blood. It literally is, you know, obviously the bread and the wine that Jesus had at the Last Supper was before he was even crucified anyway. So it was symbolic of what was to come, and now it is symbolic of what has happened in the past. But what we wanted to do, just while you guys finish getting your bread and grape juice, we want to do it a little different today. We wanted to just have a song, and you sit prayerfully, listen to the song, focus on the uh, lyrics of the song, and sit prayerfully as we just contemplate what Jesus did for us. I always ask this question anytime we have communion. I always say, why would you receive the symbol of Jesus if you haven't received Jesus? Receiving Jesus is simply choosing to believe. It's choosing to have faith in him, that he's God in the flesh, that he died on a cross, and three days later he rose from the dead. Just choosing to believe it. It's not about a mathematical formula. It's not about me trying to make it prove anything. It's just you having a longing and an emptiness in your heart to say, you know what? I believe Jesus is that answer. Jesus is my hope, and I'm going to believe. I'm going to give him my life right now. If you'd like to do that, if you'd like to receive the real Jesus before you receive the symbolic Jesus, why don't you just say a simple prayer right where you sit? Why don't you pray something like this? Dear Heavenly Father, I want you to know this. I believe. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead three days later for me. I struggle with doubts, and I have a lot to learn, but I believe in you and I trust in you. I want to start this relationship with faith. I pray that you would give me meaning. I pray that you would give me purpose. I pray that you would never leave me. I pray that you would change me. In Jesus' name, I pray. Thanks for watching, and we hope you enjoyed today's message. If God's used this ministry to impact your life in any way, then join us in reaching others by going to parkvalleychurch.com giving, where you will find different ways to give. We hope you have a great week.